Um, so I'm going to be talking about mental health. Uh, this is clearly my story and I am in no way a mental health expert, but I will give you, I've been through a little bit of trauma, so I'm just giving you my experiences to, through this. Um, one of the ways I've realized, I, there are multiple coping mechanisms. One of the ways that I very recently realized is through humor. Well, in my case, it's inappropriate humor, extremely inappropriate humor. So it goes something like this. When I was three and a half, my birth mother, she committed suicide in front of me. She burned herself in front of me. I was three and a half. I still remember her burning flesh and the smell and her crying in pain. Sometimes I still can't sleep with that, in, with that image in my thoughts. Well, now when I tell people about this, I tell them, yeah, she just cooked herself. I get a lot of awkward chuckles and a little bit of what is wrong with this chick. But I realize that for me, I don't want to look at my past in pain. I want to laugh at it. I want to not be so sad for me. My birth dad had schizophrenia. So um, at that time, he couldn't take care of me because someone needed to take care of him. So when I was young, at the age of three and a half, I moved in with my godparents. That's my dad's oldest, my mom's oldest sister and her parents. And they, this was the best family one could ask for and they loved me in the best way they knew how to, but it was not enough for me. Because there was this growing void inside which I did not understand. So when you're young, your roots are supposed to be built on family, love, and togetherness. Mine were built on insecurity, hate, and self-loathing. At the age of seven, I was raped by my domestic help. And this is when things started getting a little, a little worse. We were playing at one moment, and the next moment he tried to insert himself inside of me, but he didn't succeed. After the act, he said, if it did go in, you would have enjoyed it. I went into the bathroom crying. I knew something was wrong, but I was seven. I had no idea what was happening. So I, as I got out, he came and he apologized. He, he kept apologizing. And you have to understand, I forgave him. Now you have to understand why. It's because all my life, I just wanted to feel loved. I just wanted to feel accepted. I, I thought that it'll be OK. So I did. And we played again. And again, he tied the dupatta around me, pinned me down, and he tried to insert himself again. And this time, he succeeded. I, all I remember was the warm tear rolling down my cheek, and I just fell numb. I tried to push him with my little body, but I didn't find the strength. When he was done, I went into the bathroom. I sat under the piping hot water, and I continued crying. I cried and cried and cried, and all that I was feeling was happiness only for the piping hot water on my skin, because somehow I wanted to continue burning. My second way of coping was self-harm. Again, I should have mentioned this. There are positive notions, and there are negative notions as well. I advise always to go and try and find your positive, but when you're that young, you do not understand. I actually didn't understand this till a few months back. So I would burn myself in the hot water. That was one way. The second way, I used to have these mosquito bites as children, and I would, as a child, and I would scratch myself. I would keep scratching till blood would come out, and I would feel satisfied. Very recently, I realized that there was no mosquito anywhere. There were no mosquitoes, and I was still scratching. So whenever I have my anxiety or I get stressed out about this, I itch myself till I see blood, and I only get satisfied when I see the blood. At that point of time, his mother told me to run away with him and get married to him because he loves me. I was seven. He told me that he loves me and that no one else will ever love me. Those words are en were engraved in my soul like a tattoo, which was so difficult to heal. But it is healing. I only felt even more insecure than anything else. I did not understand what was happening, but I was living. From the age of 13 to about, from the age of uh, 8 to about 13, 
I was sexually harassed by my cousin, brother, and sister. And you think things will, will get better, but it doesn't. At this point of time, I went into child therapy. Um, and when I went into therapy, I realized, my therapist realized that there were a lot of anger, jealousy, and self-abandonment issues. The reason why I went into therapy was, like I said, I, I was very jealous. My cousin sister came, uh, and she was one year younger than me. And she came, and she sat on my dad's lap, and I flipped out. I went into my room, I took a nail, and I started gouging the wall till there was no wall left. I was so angry because I thought that my family is going to be taken away from me, that I am not going to see love ever again in my life. I thought that my family is not going to be with me anymore. So which is why I started going to therapy. My mother said, OK, she needs to go into therapy. It's about time right now. So I did. At this point of time, the therapist gave me a paper. And she gave me some crayons, and she told me, do whatever you like, because she realized I was not talking. She would be so happy about it right now if she saw me. So then she realized that I was creative, because at that point of time, I started drawing and writing. And for me, this was where I realized I stood. This, for me, was happiness. This, for me, was some sort of solace. So I started drawing and writing. I realized that I had a creative ability in myself. She realized I was dyslexic. Now, dyslexic is not a mental disorder. Dyslex dyslexia is uh, when, you, when it is a learning disability. Now, she told my mother that I have dyslexia and that I should um, get a certificate from uh, the government so that my education would be easier. My mother told her that she knew and not to do this because that would be another reason for Natasha to give up, which was very true. If I knew at that point of time, I would have not studied. But throughout my life, I only thought I was dumb. I only, the insecurity just kept growing because I couldn't read, I couldn't study, I couldn't do anything. And at that point of time, I just thought I was dumb. And that something was wrong with me because clearly, it's not getting better. After a point of time, my mother instilled this in me, that repetition is the key. She told me from a very young age not to get carried, carried away by other people, to concentrate on yourself. If, Natasha, you take three days, 10 days, one month, three months to learn something, and someone takes one day, it doesn't matter. You focus on yourself because you can do it. So the slogan that I keep saying, never give up, it was instilled in me when I was very little. From the age of 16, five years down the line, I was professionally dancing. This was the happiest time of my life. Because for the first time, I felt confident in my body. I didn't feel as self-loathing as I used to. You all have to also understand I, if you all did not know, I have depression and I have anxiety. Hi, I do. Depression for me is an extreme. It's not one thing. I either sleep too much or I don't sleep at all. I eat too much or I don't eat at all. I work too much or I don't work at all. So in my early childhood, I would not eat. I would starve myself. Again, a, a numbing device for me not to feel the pain, to stop, to just regress all my emotions that I have. So the depression and anxiety just started getting, started getting worse. But when I started dancing, it gave me a form of freedom because I didn't judge myself. I was not afraid of other people. I was not afraid of who I was. I was starting to feel confident in my body. But I was also a high-level, self-victimizing human. At the age of 19, my mother told me, Natasha, just study. Just finish your graduation. And you can do whatever you want to do. I told her I don't want to because I want to dance and I want to be a dancer and I want to travel the world and just dance and not do anything else. She begged and begged and begged and said, just dance. I didn't care. I didn't study. I failed the year. That same year, I got a knee injury. I couldn't dance at all. So the one thing that gave me happiness or the one thing that made me feel a little like home was taken away from me. 
on my left knee my meniscus muscle tore my corneal muscle tore i had liquid i had excessive liquid in my knee and my front kneecap had tears the doctor gave me an option to either walk or dance i chose to walk so for a year and a half i didn't do anything i finished my graduation yay mom's happy and now and at that point of time the void kept getting more and at this point you think that uh, i've hit rock bottom but i haven't i was still coping a year later my boyfriend at that point of time broke up with me we were dating for 5 years and now this was the first ever time i was in a serious relationship and believe me if you're in your serious relationship right now you will feel like life is over but at that point of time i did feel that and i hit rock bottom and i did not know what else to do i was so broken i was so hurt but because of that that's the only time i realized of how much healing i have to do i realized about my ab uh, abandonment issues i realized about my anger issues i realized about my trust issues and i realized i need to work on those things at that time of course i didn't realize i so at this time also you have to realize remember i was telling you um i starved myself after i broke up i just kept eating food became the love of my life food was my new best friend because i knew that food would never leave me food is never going to judge me food will always be there for me so i took into food i would eat and eat and eat till i was full and i would puke i would eat and puke and eat and puke and still continue eating i did not know how to stop all of my numbing devices all of my patterns were just to sabotage myself they were just for me not to feel love not to feel what was really hurting me from the age from about 20 i had stopped drinking and smoking but all i was doing throughout my life was going from one numbing device to the other because i didn't know how else to cope and throughout all of this i would put a smile on my face and continue my life because society doesn't know what to do with a sad person because society thinks that this is a disease and so do you because you cannot get up in the morning because you cannot look at yourself in the mirror because you feel grotesque because you do not have any solution do you do, because you do not have any momentum to do anything but no one realizes that having depression is not a choice no one chooses to feel so alone no one chooses to feel so insecure no one chooses to feel so abandoned no one chooses not to trust anyone no one chooses to not feel loved no one chooses to feel so dead inside but i also believe that the mind is powerful once i realized that this is not what i wanted to do that i wanted to leave the burden of my past wherever i'm going with whatever i'm doing with whoever i'm seeing i wanted to just stop that's when i realized that i have control over my life it took me a long 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 while to do this but i'm here to tell you that i have found positive coping mechanisms after a bundle of negative ones one i started going into therapy again at any point when it was my emotions were too intense i immediately started going to therapy i realized that talking to someone even if it's just for your objective helps so much two i started journaling and i know this sounds weird but when the thoughts get so intense when the thoughts get so jarring that you can't think of why you're feeling a certain way but when you journal it down exactly how you feel you understand the root you understand there is a way you understand your own mind when you think you can't the other thing i started doing is writing goals now these goals initially not fancy not to meet the president of india or the prime minister in our case but 
as simple as when you get up in the morning, move from one room to the other. Brush your teeth. Go down. Just walk down the stairs and come back. As basic as this. In the end of the day, I would just check like a child, seeing how I was doing. If I did it, great. If I didn't, it's okay. This is also a way I started learning to be kinder to myself, to be more gentle, because I was so bloody harsh with myself. From here, now, of course, it's changed. It is uh, make a YouTube video, uh, go out, laugh, live a little bit, be kinder to yourself. A little bit more has changed over the years. Another thing that I do is I have a gratitude journal. I feel like this is the most important because no matter what you go through in your life, you should still be grateful for whatever it is, whatever has happened. Because, And in the gratitude, it's not, oh, I have a nice smile or my hair looks great today. No, but it's internal. It's going to be, for me today, definitely, to be here having this talk right now because it takes courage and to share my story. And at the end of the night, I'll be like, I'm proud of you, Natasha, so proud. Because you'll have to understand, only you can take care of your mental health. No one else is going to. No one else cares. Everyone's more invested in their own life, which is fine. But you have the power to take care of yourself. For the longest time, all I did was compare my pain to other people. And it's OK. You can listen to my story, and you can think that, OK, she's been through so much, even I can. That's great. But I advise you to look at your pain and actually feel it, and then let go. For the longest time, I would compare myself to other people and always repress my pain. Never actually feel the pain, because I said, ah, it's OK, I'll get over it, but not actually get over it. Let my story inspire you to be honest with yourself. Let my story inspire you to remove all the facades you're creating and hug your demons and hug the negativity. Because what are our demons? What are our monsters? The parts of ourselves which are broken, which are unloved, which are tarnished. So why can't you love those parts of yourself? For the longest time, I thought I would never, ever get better. I am getting better. It's a present continuous tense. It's never, I've gotten better and I'm nailing life. Could be, but our mind is our mind. All you can do is work on yourself and keep trying to get better. That's all we can do. For the longest time again, I thought that I could never get over my pain. Because who am I without my past? Who am I without my pain? But then I did realize, and I'm here to tell you that, darling, you are so much more than your pain. Because I'm here today telling you, you can achieve whatever you put your mind to. You will have hurdles, but you will conquer them. Yes, I have bad days, but on my bad days, I know I will conquer because I have survived. I'm in a happy, healthy relationship, me. I've learned that no is a complete sentence. I've learned to take myself as a priority, which I thought I could never. I've learned that nothing ever grows from hate. Self-love, self-respect is where you start and is what will heal you. At least it is healing for me. I am healing one breath at a time. Thank you.